Hey guys, welcome back. Thank you to all the new and existing Pantheon fans for your support, likes, and social media shares. It's greatly appreciated. On April 2nd, we got an additional Pantheon live stream installment hosted once again by Code Carnage. This segment is taking place in the tower of the reckless magician, Su Ji Tal. The developers began the live stream by clearing up a few loose end questions from the previous stream, the centered on buffs and newbie items. So, Buffs and items will scale according to the level and skill of the player character. An example given was if a newbie character was given a sword with a 1 to 20 damage modifier, the damage modifiers would show the 120 since this is the correct stats of the sword. However, because the newbie character isn't high enough level to benefit from the sword's capabilities, the character would not be able to do the max damage of 20 with the sword. This somewhat falls in line with buffs as well. Buffs will show their exact stats, but this does not suggest that a newbie character would gain the maximum benefit of that particular buff, so both the weapon and spells are going to be level, skill, appropriate. We picked up a few interesting tidbits, like the alarmist mechanic can be interrupted or disrupted up to 8 seconds. It would appear that certain spells or perhaps certain ranged weapons will be able to momentarily keep an alarmist NPC at bay, perhaps to give you enough time to set up your next form of attack. Proc and clicky items themselves will also have level requirements. However, their haste and region will not. This kind of leaves a lot of room for interpretation. However, I'm going to assume that either the proc or clicky item will be adjusted to ensure that it doesn't necessarily provide too much of an advantage to say a lower level character and both the proc and clicky item will most likely be class dependent or specific. In the context of this outline, it may be fair to say that the haste and region mentioned will in fact be related to the proc and clicky itself and not necessarily a general rule for haste or region spells across the board. Combat polish was brought up since viewers from the previous stream felt that combat looked a bit static and rudimentary. The team was quick to address this observation by stating that they are working on a series of behavior dynamics for NPCs and mobs. Part of the polish involves improving the NPCs or mobs tactical awareness. NPCs or mobs may use cover or topography tactically along with casting appropriate spells to match the conditions of the encounter. Combat can be a bit of a sticky point, particularly to more modern MMO players as they are more accustomed to what I call the strafe and nape combat. In other words, they're more acclimated to their characters doing a lot more strafing, dodging, and weaving while in combat than in a more traditional sword and board spank fest. As a traditional MMO, we could probably wax quite a bit here on the old school system versus the newer system. But if you guys want to discuss the two styles or the disparities of the two, you're welcome to post your thoughts in the comment sections and I'll elaborate on the points you guys want to compare. Respawning after death was clarified. Characters will respawn at their bind location. It wasn't mentioned if certain zones will have bind NPCs, if binding will be interplayer dependent, or if characters will have their own bind system. But I'm getting ahead of myself and reflecting back on the old EQ days, I'm sure a few of you guys can remember the struggles looking for binds. Infusions were revisited and the team gave a few more clarifications on them. If you guys want a refresher on how infusions work, I'd recommend you just watch the previous stream. Since a lot of that was discussed at the beginning, it should be easy to find. We saw that Code was using a take all button when looting his corpse. I'm hoping we'll have that in the live version of the game. However, that may be just a feature for pre-alpha. We can always hope. Another loot question was raised, which entailed loot quality drops off common mobs. The team said it is possible that a player could get a rare item off a common mob. However, that rare item would be indicative to that particular common mob, say like a crafting drop that you'd need for a particular recipe. In regards to rare, no drops, or quest related drops, those will naturally be in lore specific zones. Something that was mentioned in the stream really triggered my nostalgia meter and that was the amazing news that merchant farming will be in the game. To the uninitiated, you may be wondering what this innocuous mechanic is. Suffice it to say, it's a metagame within the game and you'll just have to experience it for yourself. If people were curious about the particular buffs used during the stream, they are level appropriate and will be in the game. However, for the purposes of illustration and convenience of use, 
The team did use some GM liberties to group cast, so the spells we saw may have level requirements for group casting in the live game versus the pre-alpha. We will have lock or location system in the game for all those inclined to finding your way around via grid coordinates. Lower level characters will have a basic revive system or mechanic. The team didn't go into any details as to whether this would be class, skill, or spell based, or perhaps a combination of all three. I'm sure we'll learn more about that during game development. In the top right hand corner, you will now see an annotation appear. You're welcome to use that link to review any of the Pantheon Rise of the Fallen material we've covered so far on the channel. Keepers and the Perception System were revisited as well. In the previous stream, I meant to elaborate on the fact that when you're in a Keeper mode, or if you're currently questing, some NPCs will be aware of this and will act accordingly. This was touched on a little more in this stream, and even to the extent that the team encourages players to be Keepers. Our tome, which is where we'll store our quest lines, will perhaps play a role in how NPCs behave around us versus if someone weren't questing or weren't a keeper. So it may be fair to say that if you're in a particular zone and you're getting perception cues, then you may want to consider following up on that perception as it may garnish you more potential benefits while you're in that zone. This kind of touches on the next question that was posed to the team, and that was, will there be traditional spawn camps, and how will contested areas be handled? The team outlined that they encourage players to sort these types of encounters out amongst themselves. However, based on the fact that someone may be a keeper, and via the disposition system, spawns in that contested area could be different than the spawns the particular campers are waiting for. We received a kind of mixed response when it came to maps in the game. One thing the team was clear on was that we'd not have mini maps or radar type systems. A map system is still being determined. However, we may have to rely on fan sites like the former EQ Atlas if we're looking for detailed topography. But if I were to guess, it seems as though a dedicated map button with a UI outline of an area isn't where the team is headed. We could speculate that maybe there could be some map system in a newbie area, perhaps, but an outright dedicated drop-down menu map will probably not be in the game. Pet equipable items was brought up during the stream, and we learned that we will have the ability to equip our pets. However, the items are most likely going to be specific to that pet. In other words, an example given was that you couldn't just hand your wolf pet two swords and expect to have dual slash attack capabilities. I'm sure we'll learn more about pet behavior in combat as development continues. A question concerning first person was brought up and it was quickly illustrated by Ko that you can do everything in first person that you can do in third person. During Guild Wars 2, I could never understand why the development team wouldn't let us scroll into first person, particularly if you're in a tight or confined place. But it's good to know that Pantheon will have the ability to scroll in and out of the two perspectives. It really wasn't until I played H1Z1 that I really started doing more in third person. Group combat mechanics was touched on and it would appear that designated targeting will be available in group. This of course helps the players distinguish which mob the tank is on and which ones are currently being crowd controlled. I'm sure our inspiring tanks and crowd control classes were breathing a sigh of relief. Speaking of combat, we learned that tactical flanking will be in the game. So where your tank versus where your DPS align themselves in relationship to the mob will play a key role in combat. Your tanks will probably bear the brunt of the stuns and other mob attacks as they'll be facing the mobs directly. But your lighter armor support will be able to fight from the sides and rear, perhaps avoiding a lot of the direct melee flurries. Your tank will be mitigating. At this stage in development, we learned, at least for now, that DDs will only affect our factions and not necessarily our skills or other traits. The team didn't elaborate any more as it concerns DDs, so we'll probably just have to see where the aspects of the game leads us and how this will affect our character creation. Trading and or auction houses appear to be zone specific and not global. Naturally, you'll be able to trade with players probably anywhere and you'll have some sort of trading capability in auction houses in a specific zone the team hinted at a character merchant system, probably something that would allow us to sell offline, but that's going to be something later in development. An additional explanation on Keepers returned to the discussion during the stream, and the team stated that they will have a NPC guide, perhaps in the newbie area, that will provide us with a tutorial outline on how the Keeper system works. It will entail how to quest and maintain those quests, 
along with how to interact with NPCs. This was kind of a very general outline that was given. But it's good to know that we'll have a little bit more detail in game about how the Keeper system will work in the game world. Clipping and Collision. The team was torn about how they wanted to address this, as many of us old school EQers remember the large character players would delight themselves by blocking doors, killing the bank, or just making a general nuisance of themselves because of their stature. D-leveling. Will it be in the game? No, says the team, as they understand that not only would you lose your hard-earned level, but you'd also lose the skills, spell casting, and other capabilities that went along with the lost level. They're considering perhaps introducing an experience deficit instead of a player having to face the harshness of level loss. And that's going to wrap up this live stream comment commentary for April the 2nd. Thank you guys for the likes and comments along with sharing these videos with other Pantheon fans that you think may be interested in the game. Thanks to Ko and the development team for giving us this quick turnaround since the last stream a few days ago. If you're a new Pantheon visitor, welcome. Or if you're a regular visitor viewer, consider clicking that watermark in the bottom right hand corner and subscribe. So you'll have all the latest news, information, and live stream schedules for Pantheon.